Hello and good day to everyone. We continue with our units on stability and change in East Asia during the early modern period. Uh, and uh, now we move across the Sea of Japan, west from Japan, uh, to uh, hit the coast uh, of mainland China. Uh, and we'll look now at the quest for political stability in China. The big question here, big on the screen, but big in history as well, is how to centralize power in the world's biggest country. We've already seen it various places around the world, that it's not easy to centralize power, uh, even in a small or medium-sized state, let's say France, for instance, uh, but uh, it's uh, of a much uh, uh, higher order uh, to be able to centralize, unify a people under one government uh, in an ex uh, expansive land as big as China and with a population uh, as big a, of, uh, as China, which was already by far the world's uh, largest country at the time. We'll look at the history of two dynasties during the early modern period, the spectacular Ming dynasty, which you see here, uh, uh, which lasted for about 300 years, telling you something about uh, how spectacular it was. Bad dynasties tend not to last very long, at least those that aren't well run. Uh, and that, uh, when the Ming dynasty finally runs out of steam, uh, it's replaced by uh, the Manchu dynasty or the Qing dynasty, which also lasts for about 300 years uh, and makes it into the early years of the 20th century before collapsing uh, uh, and being the last uh, imperial dynasty in the history of China uh, to be uh, overtaken by a republican form of government uh, before that fell uh, about 30 or so years later to the Chinese communists uh, and the Chinese Communist Party uh, forms, uh, leads a government today. So uh, let's start with the Ming Dynasty, uh, and then we'll get to the uh, Qing or Manchu Dynasty as we go along. Uh, this dynasty uh, had the uh, uh, difficult task of ousting the Mongols. This is uh, uh, one of the many places around the world, particularly on the Eurasian continent, that the Mongols overran uh, and created a vast empire uh, in the Middle Ages. Uh, and the ruling dynasty uh, previous to the Ming uh, was basically run uh, by uh, the Mongols. So this is a, a foreign people that had governed China uh, by for a long time now. Uh, and it was the, the Ming dynasty or uh, uh, the leaders uh, and their armies that uh, effectively uh, finally uh, got uh, the uh, Mongols out. It's also true that Mongol rule was starting to uh, fade uh, in certain ways. So there was kind of internal weakness, uh, but also uh, quite a push uh, from uh, this uh, uh, native uh, Chinese group. Uh, the capital was established uh, of this new dynasty at Nanjing, which you see uh, uh, in the, on the map there, uh, and sort of the eastern uh, near the coast uh, uh, and to fairly uh, far south of Beijing, the capital of China today. And the capital did move uh, to Beijing uh, and will move there by the next, uh, 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 in a short amount of time. Uh, so uh, as von Sivers says, Chinese politics, politics and customs were restored and a powerful centralized government was put into place. Uh, this new imperial state would, with minor modifications, see China into the 20th century. Uh, but I just said there were two uh, uh, dynasties. Uh, yes, but what the, the author is saying here is that the uh, uh, Qing dynasty didn't change too much uh, of what had been put in place by the Ming dynasty before it, the administrative uh, system, the way government was, or was organized, uh, etc. That doesn't mean there aren't any, or any changes, but there weren't that many. The founder of the Ming Dynasty, uh, the great uh, Emperor Hong Wu, uh, who ruled from 1368 to 1398, uh, which you can see there. Uh, so it was under his leadership, uh, his military prowess, uh, that uh, the Mongols were driven out. As I told you, he temporarily, anyway, moved the capital to Nanjing. It was, ended up being temporary anyway, uh, and built a tightly centralized state. 
So uh, this is uh, the first time in uh, uh, a long time uh, that uh, uh, China had been unified, uh, you know, at least by uh, uh, you know, somebody indigenous to the country and not by a Mongol leader. Uh, as W. Scott Morton, in a, a fairly recent uh, history of China and its culture, says the care, subtlety, and occasional brilliance of the policies of the central government in eras when it appears to have been, when it appears to have acted in an enlightened and highly responsible manner uh, as under the rule of Hong Wu. So uh, he's giving a compliment to uh, uh, this uh, emperor, but also others like him. China uh, had many uh, good emperors, uh, some bad ones as well, but it's over a long, long course of time that we're talking about. Uh, but we'll see actually some brilliant uh, leaders, and he might be uh, counted as one of them. In an attempt to reduce uh, peasant suffering, the Emperor Hong Wu intensified imperial autocracy, which means kind of tight control from the top, uh, which isn't always too pleasant, uh, and the extraction of services from people in fixed hereditary occupations. Hong Wu continued the policy of flogging officials who displeased him while personally overseeing matters of state. Uh, so uh, he wasn't a, uh, he was a micromanager. He wasn't someone who liked to delegate authority. He wanted to oversee every little detail uh, and try to uh, you know, miss nothing, uh, which uh, you know, micromanaging can be a problem sometimes. But uh, uh, the more go-getter type leaders in world history uh, uh, tend to want to be involved in everything they can. They still have to delegate some things, uh, especially uh, in more recent times or now, as government has gotten bigger and more complex as the centuries go by. Uh, but uh, even in his day, in the 14th century, Hong Wu had to delegate some things. But he tried, uh, certainly, uh, and probably got pretty far, uh, in uh, you know um, being uh, you know, involved in all the meetings and sort of overseeing everything, flogging officials isn't something that's unique to uh, Chinese uh, government. In Europe, Peter the Great of Russia uh, was uh, carried a stick around with him uh, and beat uh, uh, his uh, assistants, and if he didn't like uh, what they what they said, uh, but uh, uh, this certainly shows that top-down rule in the Ming Dynasty uh, could be uh, tough, but uh, it did get the job done as far as maintaining law and order and keeping everybody in line uh, within a hierarchical system. So fixed hereditary occupations uh, uh, meant that uh, uh, if you were born into a farm family, you were pretty much staying in a farm family, uh, which which you know uh, goes against our ideas of you know uh, liberty, uh, and opportunity, uh, but uh, there is something to be said, at least in the 14th century, for the stability that's brought uh, with everybody kind of uh, you know, knowing uh, what their uh, occupation, what their job is. But it's certainly lacking in uh, you know, liberty. Perpetual happiness under uh, uh, Yang Lei. Uh, and uh, this, uh, uh, his r real name was Zhu Di. Uh, many of the Chinese emperors, the uh, the name they take as emperor isn't their real name. Uh, in this case, he took on uh, the name that meant uh, perpetual happiness. Uh, uh, and I put a question mark. Was it perpetual happiness under uh, uh, Yang Lei? Uh, well, uh, uh, depends on who you asked, I suppose. But he further centralized China. Uh, in the Ming Dynasty, uh, conquered lots of foreign territory. Uh, he supported China's great maritime fleet, uh, which we're about to, uh, to talk about, see. And he started the rebuilding of Peking uh, and uh, uh, what is now still known as the Forbidden City. So a lot of accomplishments there, and he was around at kind of a crucial time uh, in Chinese history. Uh, according to uh, the uh, Morton's book, History and Culture, uh, uh, he put his military experience to use. Uh, so he had military experience as a leader uh, uh, before becoming emperor, emperor uh, in a manner rarely seen in emperors, and himself took charge of five expeditions into the steppes, 
which means kind of into the interior uh, of China, uh, far you know, away from the coast, scoring victories uh, uh, over the Tatars uh, and Orits, uh, two uh, uh, long-time sort of foes and neighbors of the Chinese. Uh, the same historian goes on to uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, how scholars themselves are divided as to the necessity and value of his removal of the Ming capital from Nanjing to Peking. Uh, so Nanjing hadn't been the stopping place for all that long. Uh, the northern uh, uh, site uh, had the advantage of, I said, I wrote sit, uh, had the advantage of enabling a, a closer watch to be kept over the movements of the nomads. Uh, this had been a problem going back centuries before this. On the northern and northwestern frontier, uh, the nomadic peoples uh, were multiple uh, in terms of uh, different cultures, but they were always a thorn in the side to the Chinese, often raiding Chinese towns and cities uh, and uh, difficult to defeat because uh, riding and fighting on horseback was their specialty, uh, and so uh, it wasn't easy to defeat them. Uh, so uh, he moved the capital, uh, uh, Yong, Yong Lei moved the capital so it would be closer to the action uh, so he could defend better against the nomads. Whether or not that it had the desired effect or not is open to question, partly what historians uh, still are divided about. Uh, but more important, uh, maybe the fact that the northern sites uh, uh, sundered the government uh, from contact with understanding uh, uh, with and understanding of the vast and increasingly important southern section of the country, its problems, and its rever reservoir of often brilliant scholar officials. Nanjing, which we've already seen on an earlier map here, uh, is further to the south. Uh, and in a way, what's being said here is that the, uh, the future of China uh, was kind of moving south uh, at the very time that this emperor is moving the capital north. Uh, so much of uh, the uh, growth of the economy, uh, rice-based economy, uh, takes place uh, in the South, at least from this point forward. Building the Forbidden City. Uh, so uh, during uh, Yang uh, Le's reign, uh, he at least started the beginning uh, of this uh, fabulous uh, uh, city, uh, and uh, uh, that's a modern picture of it today. Uh, though it's not as clear as I'd hoped. Uh, the emperor, as uh, 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 Shaughnessy tells us uh, in his uh, book, China, uh, Empire uh, and uh, Civilization, uh, a really good single volume book on the whole history of China, uh, he tells us that the emperor lived in a magnificent complex of palace buildings, meaning after this city was constructed, which you see here, uh, which reflected his elevated status and his relationship to cosmic forces and to his family, advisors, and subjects. To those privileged enough to visit it, the palace provided an impressive display of imperial, imperial power and wealth. At the same time, its high walls excluded both the common people and especially potential enemies. So, uh, And from this time forward, uh, emperors lived in the Forbidden City, and uh, they really were isolated. Uh, they lived uh, lives that were quite remote from the daily lives of the average people because they were actually walled off from them and vice versa. Uh, and uh, the, uh, you know, the buildings, the architecture, the, the grounds are spectacular. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, th this is uh, uh, you know, a, a tremendous work of art, among other things. But as the quote says, it was also a tremendous show of power. Uh, I mentioned uh, in our last lecture, uh, uh, I analogized something in Japan to Louis XIV's France, uh, but the same uh, uh, can be done here as well. Remember that Louis uh, uh, forced the, uh, actually it was the same point that I made, but Louis forced the nobility to live at Versailles, his uh, palace, uh, but the palace itself, I didn't make this point, uh, in the last segment, but uh, you probably remember this. Hopefully you do. Uh, but uh, Versailles intimidated uh, other people. This was meant to intimidate them. It was meant to be so fantastically large and uh, you know uh, splendid in appearance that people would come and say, wow, 
Uh, this guy must be the most powerful and rich person in the world, the wealthiest you know guy in the world. Look at this place. Uh, and that's basically what the Forbidden City uh, was meant to do as well. Uh, intimidate uh, everyone else uh, and sort of separate and elevate the emperor from everyone else. It had that effect. That's, again, a more clear picture of the whole complex uh, walled in, uh, uh, in the modern day. Yang Lei also uh, oversaw uh, the Chinese uh, fleet and its maritime reconnaissance uh, during this period uh, um, under the command of the Admiral uh, Zheng He, who you see here. Uh, in his uh, birth uh, and uh, date of death, more uh, uh, approximate uh, there. Uh, but uh, Yang Lei made a uh, impactful, uh, fateful decision uh, uh, in Chinese history uh, about this fleet. Uh, but uh, uh, let's start with a quote uh, from uh, uh, Mr. Professor Armesto's book. With, quoted before, he says between 1405 and 1433, seven formidable, formidable flag-waving expeditions ranged the Indian Ocean under Admiral Zheng He. The scale of his efforts was massive. The first expedition was said to comprise 62 junks, ships, of the largest dimensions ever built, 225 support vessels, and 17,780 men. The vessels, to judge from a recently discovered rudder post, so a recently discovered piece of the ship, uh, justified the award, the odd terms of contemporary assessments, displacing perhaps over 3,000 tons. Uh, this was 10 times the size of the largest ships, of, ships afloat in Europe at the time. 10 times. Uh, so I, I think I may have said this, uh, at least alluded to this once before, but uh, these ships were far beyond anything the Europeans had in terms of size, uh, you know, technology, uh, weaponry. Uh, it's just incredible. And the fateful decision that uh, Yang Lei made after seven voyages to the Indian Ocean, during which time the fleet never saw action, at least no major action uh, in battle. They, they basically did a seven goodwill tours of the Indian Ocean uh, you know, area and you know, port cities, part of the Indian Ocean uh, trade. Uh, but, of course, goodwill tours are never quite what they seem, at least when it's uh, naval vessels you know, coming into a foreign port. Uh, the Americans did this uh, something quite similar to this uh, around the turn of the 20th century under President Theodore Roosevelt, the Great White Fleet, which toured uh, kind of the world and stopped in it various exotic ports of call but the the you know unstated purpose uh, of these kind of things is to intimidate to show everybody uh, how much firepower you have you don't have to even say it because they can see the ships and how big they are and uh, you know how menacing uh, they are or could be so you can come in and say hey we're just here to uh, uh, spread the cheer and spread goodwill and you know nego uh, you know make uh, uh, deals with you, trade deals, and uh, hopefully improve relations between uh, you know our country and yours. And uh, it's all one, it's all good, it's all wonderful. Uh, don't pay attention to those gigantic uh, ships, uh, you know, with uh, uh, you know, frightening weapons on them, because uh, we're here for pe we're here for peaceful purposes. So uh, this is more or less was done uh, in these seven voyages to the Indian Ocean. But again, Yang Lei made the decision after the seventh uh, expedition, uh, to scuttle the fleet permanently. And this is a gigantic operation, but that's part of the reason uh, uh, that it was scuttled. Uh, it was very expensive to maintain and operate. Uh, and uh, the, a decision was made. Uh, there was disagreement at the Chinese or the emperor's court. His court means kind of the place where his advisors hang out with him and they talk about issues. Uh, and one group said, uh, emphasized the need for the fleet. Uh, another group said, no, we can't afford that and continue to put up, uh, you know, uh, effective defense against the ever dangerous nomads on the northern frontier. So we have to choose one or the other. Uh, and they convinced uh, Yang Lei that they had to choose one or the other. He had to choose one or the other. And in the end, he chose to 
spend the money on dealing with the nomads, uh, and so scuttled the fleet. Uh, this was a fateful decision, as I said, because uh, had they not, or had he not made that decision, had he made the opposite choice and kept the fleet, uh, it's possible when the Europeans, as we already know, starting with the Portuguese, came around the Cape uh, southern tip of Africa into the Indian Ocean doing armed trade, that the Chinese fleet may have been there uh, and been uh, you know, effective enough and high-tech enough, massive enough to throw them out, to keep them out. Uh, and that might have uh, changed the course of history, maybe significantly. Uh, it's, I think it's, it, you know, it's a what-if question because we don't know. It didn't happen that way. But I think it's a fair what if question to at least speculate about uh, because uh, there's, I think, some reason to believe that uh, uh, this fleet would have uh, uh, you know, thrown, uh, thrown off any attacks uh, by any European country's uh, vessels uh, or you know, a fleet uh, from Portugal or wherever else. And so uh, is it possible that had this fleet uh, not been scuttled, the Europeans would have never gotten into the Indian Ocean? Uh, at least not in time to rise to power and, and wealth uh, and go on to dominate the globe for a number of centuries? Possibly. So a uh, big decision on the shoulders of Yang Lei. It's possible he made the, he might made the wrong choice. But let's not uh, let's not mistake the fact that the nomads to the north were uh, a very serious problem. Uh, and uh, had to be dealt with, uh, you know, in one way or another. So uh, uh, you know, this was an enviable decision uh, to have to, you know, choose either way. Also, uh, uh, in the later Ming Dynasty, so after uh, Yong Lei and the initial uh, reign of Hong Wu, uh, remember this dynasty went on for 300 years, so we're skipping uh, pretty far ahead. Uh, but uh, uh, Morton says to us here, to meet the menace of the nomad tribes in the north, which is to be a constant threat throughout Chinese history, sections of defensive walls already built by three of the former kingdoms, meaning three of the earlier empires and dynasties, were strengthened, joined, and extended to form a single wall along the northern frontier, one of the most ambitious construction projects ever undertaken in any civilization. Uh, of course, I asked the question at the top, uh, was this the most ambitious project ever? It's up there with the pyramids in Egypt and you know, uh, plenty of things in the, in the modern world uh, since. The later Ming emperors sought to protect their realm by building the Great Wall of China along the northern border. Uh, according to Bentley, of course, uh, workers by the hundreds of thousands labored throughout the late 15th and 16th centuries to build a formidable stone and brick barrier, which in the end was about 1,550 miles long uh, and about 40 or so feet high on, on, on average. Uh, uh, if you look at the photograph there, modern photograph, but uh, uh, what an incredibly impressive structure. Did it have the desired effect of keeping the nomads out? Well, to some degree, yes. You can see in the on the right, the map shows it, it does extend uh, uh, you know, quite some ways. It wasn't necessarily easy to get uh, over uh, and certainly wasn't easy to get around. So uh, it, it had uh, some defensive uh, you know, protection. Uh, it better uh, for that much time, that much expense, hundreds of thousands of uh, people uh, doing the work uh, uh, you know, uh, through uh, uh, parts of two centuries. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, it's one of the most famous, of course, man-made uh, projects uh, uh, to this very day. Uh, and it's, in a sense, uh, uh, you know, an extension of the worry we just talked about that caused uh, the previous emperor, Yang Lei, uh, to actually scuttle a, uh, an, an impressive fleet in its entirety in order to uh, deal uh, with uh, the nomad problem. This wall was built. Uh, and again, sections of it had been built earlier, but uh, uh, at all times, all sections, or when they finally connected them uh, all, or mostly here, uh, it was with uh, the nomads uh, and the dangers they posed in mind. Uh, an emperor called Wan Li uh, uh, is a good example. He, re he reigned for a long time, uh, but he's a good example of the 
latter years, uh, latter decades of the Ming Dynasty, sometimes called the later Ming Dynasty, uh, when it was sort of in decline. So its healthier years were earlier on, uh, the two emperors we've talked about and others. But uh, he's uh, this guy, Wan Li, is an example of the decline. Uh, and his relationship with the uh, eunuchs uh, is uh, kind of uh, part of the story here as well. Uh, as Professor Bentley writes, the emperors sometimes ignored government affairs for decades on end during the latter uh, know, uh, Ming dynasty while satisfying their various appetites. An interesting way to put it. Uh, throughout his long reign, for example, the emperor Wan Li uh, refused to meet with government officials. Instead, while indulging his taste for wine, he conducted business through eunuch, intermediary, uh, eunuch intermediaries. Powerful eunuchs uh, won the favor of the later Ming emperors by procuring concubines for them and providing for their amusement. Uh, the eunuchs used their power and position to enrich themselves and lead lives of luxury. Uh, as their influence increased, corruption and inefficiency spread throughout the government and weakened the Ming state. So what are eunuchs? Who are eunuchs? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> some of you may already know. Uh, it's uncomfortable to even talk about, uh, but eunuchs are men uh, who have uh, certain body parts uh, 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 taken off. Uh, uh, yes, the, the ones that are about reproduction. Uh, and uh, uh, you, you see this in some other places and times in history as well, where eunuchs uh, are often trusted uh, and used as advisors by kings, uh, rulers, governments. Uh, why would they care uh, about the genitals, uh, you know, whether they were attached or not, uh, uh, to uh, male uh, leaders? Because uh, in earlier times, this is earlier times, uh, it was quite common for power to be uh, done or uh, extended hereditarily. So through families who, you know, the family member would inherit a throne, either the king or the emperor, but other things as well. So eunuchs could be trusted, at least in the sense that they're not going to have families. They're not going to have a son uh, that can challenge you or your son for power later on. They're more likely to be uh, loyal because it's not about, uh, uh, you know, uh, their, uh, uh, you know, their family line. They're going to have no family line. Uh, it stops with it stops with them. So uh, the eunuchs uh, had been around before, but they sort of really make inroads in terms of power here, and they became almost like kind of a political party, uh, 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 competing for power or the ear of the emperor emperors uh, with the uh, uh, the uh, mandarins, uh, the uh, sort of uh, bureaucrats. Uh, intellectual bureaucrats, so uh, the mandarins on one side uh, uh, and the eunuchs on the other. The mandarins tended to hold the uh, official positions of government, uh, so be uh, you know, to advise the emperors in a more official capacity. The eunuchs uh, tended to do so in a more unofficial way, but they sometimes won out because if they convince the emperor, then that's pretty much final. The Manchus, uh, it's the Manchus that took down uh, the Ming dynasty after it started to fade and was in decline. Uh, so who were the Manchus? Well, I'm going to tell you. Uh, and uh, this comes uh, from the book China, uh, Empire and Civilization uh, by uh, Ed Shaughnessy. Uh, the Manchus mostly were pastoral nomads, uh, although many had turned to agriculture and settled in the rich farmlands of southern Manchuria. Uh, during the late 16th and early 17th centuries, uh, an ambitious chieftain named uh, Nurhaci uh, unified Manchu tribes uh, into a centralized state, promulgated a code of laws, and organized a powerful military force. During the 1620s and 1630s, the Manchu this group of people, uh, expelled Ming garrisons in Manchuria, captured Korea and Mongolia, uh, no small feats, uh, and launched small-scale invasions into China itself. So the handwriting was already on the wall 
uh, by the 1620s and 1630s, uh, this was a group of people that had now kind of unified, gone from being very decentralized and lots of separate tribes, but unified uh, by one leader who promulgated, a, again, a law code, which helps to unify, uh, organized a powerful military force, uh, and uh, don't think that the Ming uh, leaders, emperors and government, uh, weren't aware that this could be pro a problem, and it eventually turned into a major problem, uh, and the Manchus and their army uh, uh, seized Peking, what's now, what's now Beijing, uh, in 1644. Uh, ushering in uh, a new dynasty, the Manchu or Qing dynasty. So we get to that dynasty now, uh, and one of its symbols, uh, the dragon there on the left, uh, and a map of China uh, on the right, uh, and you can see huge amounts of territorial expansion through military conquests uh, during this uh, long-lived 300-some uh, year-long dynasty. Uh, as uh, Von Sivers says, uh, the situation of the Qing represents a curious relationship between a cultural core and its periphery, uh, in which the conquest of the core by the periphery brings the core temporary renewal, but the interests of, the, uh, of stability loom so large for the newcomers that they become the ones who cling most tenaciously to the forms of the old order. In this view, uh, by the end of the uh, a Qing period, uh, when the empire was faced with foreign pressure and domestic agitation for reform, the Manchu court and nobility were willing to risk the collapse of the empire to preserve the power of their dynasty and position. So this is to say uh, that uh, this relationship between periphery and core, core means kind of the center area that you know is powerful, at least at first, uh, periphery being kind of outlying regions, uh, that usually, you know, have to be subordinate to the capital city or the or the core, uh, and uh, uh, this happens in other places as well in history. The curious relationship, where when a core, uh, the government itself starts to fade uh, in its power or starts to become lackluster in its leadership, uh, uh, the, its economy starts to go south. Uh, sometimes uh, ideas. Uh, and uh, energy from the periphery uh, helped kind of fuel a, a renewal, a revival, uh, uh, ideas sort of out on the edge. In, in the history uh, later on of the British Empire, uh, which we'll get to, uh, in the 18th century, uh, two peripheral uh, parts of the empire, Scotland uh, and the American colonies, which became the United States, provided a, a, a real shot in the arm in terms of ideas uh, intellectual power, a uh, number of brilliant thinkers and writers writing, writing about government and philosophy, uh, uh, you know, uh, education, etc., etc. So uh, uh, peripheral core relationships are extremely interesting, uh, and uh, uh, this is kind of a, a, a pattern uh, whereby when the core starts to decay, the periphery can kind of come to the rescue, uh, and uh, um, it sometimes has new ideas because this hasn't been bogged down uh, with sort of doing power this and, and you know things the same way uh, and isn't as under the isn't as much under the watchful eye of the capital uh, its police its military its leaders because they're out on the periphery uh, and but but uh, what can happen is what happens here uh, the periphery can be so healthy and the core are so damaged that the periphery ends up becoming the core. Uh, and so uh, the Manchus get into the Ming dynasty uh, and uh, uh, they uh, have too much uh, uh, you know, uh, vitality uh, and uh, uh, conquer the whole thing. Uh, but the quote here uh, goes on to say, and I'm making it, it lo a lot longer than the quote, uh, but I'm trying to explain this so that you understand what's being said, that the, uh, the people on the periphery once they get into power, they're not used to being in power, and they feel the need, not in all cases, but this is fairly common, as I said, to uh, uh, maintain old ways of doing things. So that the, the, the Manchus uh, held on to, which I already mentioned, by the way, uh, held on to many of the traditions and customs and laws and you know methods of governing uh, that had been done by the Ming Dynasty. So much so, as the quote tells us, that uh, uh, by the end 
uh, of the Manchu dynasty, of the Qing dynasty. Uh, they were willing to take the risk that the whole thing was going to collapse uh, rather than change. They were so set in their ways, uh, the once sort of very vital uh, uh, periphery uh, was now a, a, you know, a, a, a just totally stationary core. Uh, and so this set up the eventual uh, uh, you know, uh, Manchu dynasty fall as well in 1911. Two brilliant emperors, uh, two of the greatest in all of Chinese history, uh, maybe two of the most gifted uh, and uh, able kings in all of world history. Uh, uh, we see here uh, uh, one Kang Shi, uh, who reigned uh, or lived from 1661 to 1722, uh, uh, a, a dazzling uh, leader if there ever was one. Uh, and uh, Morton's book uh, uh, says uh, about him that uh, uh, Kang Shi uh, uh, com commanded a large Chinese force which penetrated as far as Urga in Outer Mongolia and defeated a powerful Khan, which means leader, chief, king, uh, of the Western Mongols, uh, the mounted nomads uh, in Mongolia, uh, whose fighting skills had dominated the steppes for so long with uh, their horses, uh, you know, gifted uh, horse warfare uh, warriors. Uh, for so long, uh, they were now doomed to decline, however, for the Chinese employed artillery with deadly effect. Horses uh, were too much for uh, and men with like spears and uh, you know, arrows and crossbows when they're on their f on foot, uh, but horses uh, were no match themselves for the use of artillery, uh, which the Chinese uh, had helped to uh, a pioneer in the first place. Certainly, gunpowder weapons uh, as a whole. Uh, however, uh, the same author goes on to say that uh, military. Uh, prowess was by no means uh, uh, his only uh, uh, interest. So by no means uh, did he confine himself to the pursuit of military activity. Uh, a brilliant ruler, a scholar, and an all-around personality, uh, uh, Kang Shi, uh, enjoyed hunting in the manner hunting in the manner of his ancestors and built a summer palace uh, for the purpose north of Peking. So this guy was a gifted military leader. Uh, he was a brilliant uh, scholar interested in uh, uh, many different subjects, uh, had a vivacious, outgoing personality, uh, and liked to have fun too, hunting and uh, summer uh, you know, vacation uh, uh, places, uh, etc. Uh, so he was a, a formidable uh, uh, person uh, who happened to also be the emperor of China. Uh, uh, Kang Shi uh, uh, made it a point uh, to go on inspection tours in South China, uh, Morton goes on to say, which had the double advantage of keeping him in touch with that reservoir of first-rate scholar officials or scholar bureaucrats and of enabling him to check on the conservancy of the Yellow and Huai Rivers and on the Grand Canal artery, which brought tribute rice from the south. The Grand Canal was a man-made waterway connecting uh, you know, natural waterways that uh, in many ways is kind of like an economic superhighway for China, mainly connecting sort of uh, North and South China, South and North China. Uh, and the rice tribute meant sort of taxation brought to the court uh, at the Forbidden City, uh, the capital, uh, in rice. Uh, a tribute uh, is uh, like taxation, uh, but it's often brought in kind, not in money. Uh, and there are some personal attachments that come uh, with it. It's not just sort of impersonal numbers as it is, as taxes are in our side. Day. Nonetheless, it's still a tax. Uh, most important, uh, Kang Shi had a genuine love of scholarship and succeeded in attracting to his side some of the best Chinese literati of his time, meaning literary uh, uh, you know, personages. Uh, so uh, men of letters, uh, brilliant writers uh, and thinkers, uh, were sort of around him all the time. So uh, uh, this uh, leader uh, was on the ball kind of in every way. Again, one of the, the, the greats in all of Chinese history. His grandson, uh, 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 Qianlong, 
uh, was uh, also uh, a great emperor. Uh, so was, by the way, his father in between. I just don't have time to cover all these guys. So grandpa, dad, uh, and grandson uh, were three uh, uh, really uh, good uh, to gifted emperors in a row. Uh, the uh, book by von Sivers, who I've quoted uh, incessantly now in lecture after lecture, says that the reign of Qianlong marked both the high point and the beginning of the decline of the Qing dynasty uh, and of imperial China itself. Uh, the period witnessed China's expansion to its greatest size in the imperial era. Uh, this was accompanied by a doubling of its population to perhaps 300 million by 1800. Our country today, the U.S., is about uh, 300 million today, uh, and China was already at 300 million in 1800. Uh, uh, remarkable. Uh, uh, by almost any measure, its internal economy dwarfed that of any other country and equaled or surpassed that of Europe as a whole until the Industrial Revolution was well underway, a subject, the Industrial Revolution, which we're going to get to soon enough. Uh, but uh, uh, China was an economic giant uh, already by this time, and certainly relatively speaking, relative to the rest of the world, uh, and all, uh, uh, in, in, incredible. So as I said at the outset of this uh, section of this segment, to centralize uh, you know control and power in, in a country uh, in an economy the size of China's uh, is an, an enormous achievement. Uh, uh, I don't mean it you know makes them uh, nice people. Uh, you know, to, uh, being a nice person isn't sort of a, a necessity in centralizing power. Nonetheless, it's still a, a difficult thing to pull off one way or the other. Uh, the historian in question here goes on to say that uh, uh, Chan uh, Long carried on the tradition of an autocratic but hardworking and morally concerned ruler. Chan Long's interest in scholarship was as genuine as that of his grandfather. So he was also uh, a gifted scholar and thinker, loved ideas and books. And under his patronage, a vast collection known as the Four Treasuries was completed. Uh, seven sets of 36,000 volumes containing 3,450 entire works uh, were completed under the four categories, four treasuries, in which the Chinese were accustomed to divide their, liter uh, their literature. Even before this, they were accustomed to divide into these four kind of categories, classics, history, philosophy, and belles lettres. Uh, and that's fancy French for basically lit literature. Uh, so uh, uh, that that's a, an intellectual and cultural achievement of the first and highest order, uh, showing us uh, something that we all should know already, uh, but that China, uh, its civilization, uh, was breathtaking and impressive uh, across the board. Uh, intellectual achievement, cultural achievements, uh, political, you know, scientific, technological, and on and on and on. And it's, uh, of course, partly why it's still a major in its size, uh, also uh, you know, why it's a major force in the world to this day. Uh, and so is Japan, by the way, uh, uh, at the beginning uh, of our unit uh, in the first segment. And we have one more segment to go.